I wasn't able to get here because of the snow. <laughs> um, I've looked at his book. Um, so there are some different uh, forms, but basically what Connecticut, Arizona, Maine now have, maybe in other states, and New York City still has, and I think Los Angeles has a little. They used to have cover all around the city, and they went down to just the city council. So, um, is two cardinal principles. First, any candidate for public office that's covered by this law cannot accept private money from corporations or individuals. Every, everywhere I think only if the candidate wants to be a publicly financed candidate. I think they have a right to opt out and go traditionally. I'm not sure the courts have tested whether they could be mandated to refuse private contributions, but I don't think it's happened anywhere. You'd have to make a strong case of corruption in the sense of the Buckley case that the Suffolk professor was talking about to do that. But anyway, as of now, each candidate can either run the way you do now, taking money anywhere you can get it, or, or there's some restrictions how much each individual can contribute and how much corporations can contribute. But if you've heard a lot of references to the Citizens United case, you now know they can pay for independent expenditures, called, also called super PACs, and that's unlimited and they pretty much can help the candidate just as more to her, 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 her opponent just as more. Um, so one side is, for those who participate, no private contributions. Uh, what's happened in Maine, I'm not sure about the other states, so many of the people running and the incumbent legislators, I think even governors, became public with finance, that whenever there was an exceptional person who was going to raise their own money, the fact that they were going to use private money and therefore be beholden maybe to the people that give it to them, the corporations that give it to them, was helpful in the publicly financed candidate to defeat uh, the one who was privately. So there were very few privately left in Maine. In Maine. For the legislature, the governor, I think, is still have, have people uh, maybe 50-50. And the other side is that the public, as taxpayers, provide the money for the campaigns. And there are usually set amounts for each office in the lodge of the territory. The uh, U.S. Senator is the most of the state, the reps, uh, Congress, state reps, state um, senators get less. Um, and the money comes, I think, from every place that now has the law, general tax revenues. But Professor Lessig uh, proposes or supports what was called, I think, the Graham Richardson proposal first. Namely, that instead of just paying our taxes and having the money processed and part of it go to public financing, or, of elections, each taxpayer, if they wanted, could um, have $50 of the tax they pay directed to the candidate they select. And he also proposes allowing $100 contributions to the public candidates. He says if people want to feel they're a part of it, maybe our old capitalistic society, we don't feel we're a part of it unless we pay for it. Um, but in any event, uh, the usual route is just regular tax money. Um, I don't know too much about that Graham proposal. I haven't thought a lot about it, but it seems to me it creates another little election where you campaign with taxpayers to persuade them to give you the 50 bucks. And it could waste a lot of campaign resources, I think, for one thing. But um, the other wrinkle that I think is pretty basic is that if a publicly funded candidate is opposed by a privately funded one who has a lot more money, that candidate can get some more, probably not as much as the privately financed, but hopefully a, an amount that makes that public candidate 
close to competitive. Very much not, not competitive. That's all we're talking about public money. So it can't be given away for free. So thus, as I understand it, the basic outline. Anybody think I left anything out or anything wrong about what we're talking about? Are the uh, programs in Maine and other states um, matched funds or just purely um, publicly funded? I know, I mean, I've, I've heard of programs in which candidates can raise money themselves and then have it matched by uh, the government right. to make know, them more competitive. I don't know that that's main or the way it's done, but the part I forgot to say in the, in the uh, list of the uh, general characteristics is that not anyone can say I'll run for senator and pick up the 17,000 or whatever it's going to go to each county. They have to show that they're viable by some means and generally it's uh, either polls, the kind of thing that's used to say who can get up on the debate stage when we have presidential and candidates, uh, or m amount of money raised privately. And I think most of the systems, and I think Maine is one, require some amount of money. They don't use the polling of the people's choice for that office at that time, but you have to raise maybe total of a thousand dollars and contributions of no more than a hundred, maybe a little more. So that's another characteristic. But I, I haven't heard of a system where no matter what the government gives you, you can then raise, or all along be raising, you can raise an amount equal to what the government gives you. I haven't thought too much about how that would work. Well, that would be a problem for, for the Treasury, though. Some people raise a lot of money, and someone would and that's one of the supposed advantages of public financing that levels the playing field between those who can either raise a lot uh, and those who can't. I was going to say, well, those who are going to spend their own money, but you can't say that because in Buckley versus Vallejo, the professor from Suffolk uh, talked about, the Supreme Court said there can't be any limit on how much a person spends on their own campaign. The Supreme Court thought that was a free speech. But the Supreme Court in the same decision, 1976, ruled you can have limits on how much other people can give on the theory of leveling the playing field so that you don't just have incumbents piling up big watches or deterring new people from challenging them. Uh, and the theory that, uh, I'm surprised, but even the Supreme Court uses the term corruption, by which they don't mean legal corruption or bribery or the crime of bribery, but they mean feeling that the, the elected incumbent feels indebted to the people that got him elected, gave the money, and can't help but be influenced, and maybe influenced too much, too long, and that can be corruption. So those are the basic characteristics. Um, anybody, uh, I know we've got a person who has thought through very strongly and well with objections to it and reasons to allow uh, as much money as people can raise be used. Anyone think of what the advantages are? I, I, I guess I sort of mentioned them earlier, level the playing field between people who have money and people who don't, uh, not being indebted, captured by corporations who give to you. Well, let me see if any other advantage before we get to the uh, disadvantage. I guess uh, for me, I see um, political equality as sort of like a paramount principle of democracy or representative democracy that, like we have in the U.S. And by allowing unlimited contributions of money and deeming that free speech, you are completely dismantling political equality. Um, and I guess, like, I think we need to come up with some sort of way to disassociate your economic power and your political power. And I'm completely fine if you have a lot of money, you can yield, you know, um, a lot of economic power and sort of drive the way the market's going to work. But I don't think that you should have that same ability in the political arena. Um, and I guess from my point of view, I've kind of been entertaining some sort of like uh, publicly financed coupon system where like each in each uh, taxpayer citizen is essentially given 
a coupon for X number of dollars that is tax funded, and then as the campaigns go on, you're able to give your coupon to whichever candidate you feel is you know best suited for your needs, and that way you're now capping the amount of money that's going into it, giving everyone an equal say whether or not they have you know million dollars in assets or no money. Um, so I don't know. That's kind of my my thought process. I know, and the coupon system needs to be worked out, but it's kind of like where my head goes because now, now you're giving everyone the chance to either say I want to support someone or I don't want to support someone, regardless of their economic standing, um, which I think is sort of key to actually having a representative democracy. Yeah, I tried to mention that one about the fifty dollars for yeah. every taxpayer, uh, but I didn't realize or uh, hadn't heard that it can be given throughout the campaign, like the last week of the campaign, as well as in the middle as well. I think there would have to be some sort of installments because, like, you know, how does the campaign get started? How how are you gonna decide? So there's got to be some sort of like. Um, yeah. So I think there's some. You know, there's some base that if you are seen as a viable candidate based on the criteria you were talking about, you're given some sort of base amount of money to start campaigning. And as you're campaigning, the, the public each has their coupon that they can distribute to whoever they seem fit. To, uh, um, we need our cast. The usual. If, or if you're interested in being in the skit, we've had a couple of dropouts. Okay? Skit, back of the row. The, the usual criticism. Well, don't, okay, well, I'll, I'll start the criticism a little bit. What I agree with Tim is that I'm going to be Personally, to me, democracy is one person, one vote, no one. Has more than one vote, and everyone has one vote, and it doesn't vary according to how much uh, you've been successful in our capitalist economy, or you've inherited it, yeah. or you won the lottery. It's all <laughs> other ways to get it. Uh, I think that's the basic reason that the United States have, have adopted, have decided to do that. Uh, it's separating economics from democracy, from our political system. And meaning that since everybody who votes only has one vote, there's no reason to think that the person who becomes senator will favor anyone, even if they're billionaires, because they don't give to them. They can't get private contributions. Okay, let's hear what's wrong with it from a very articulate friend here. No close-up, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the ideas in, that have been in my head have been, I, I, I like and I, I respond to free freedom of speech. And I do think that how you want to spend your money, there, we want to be very careful about are we restricting that in any way. And the way I think about it is the, the areas that should be regulated are anything where there's, there's a limited resource, where there's a limited commodity. The most obvious example is the amount of TV commercial advertising time that's available. That has to be regulated. Because right now, the example I was telling Jules before, is that Rick Santorum came out of Iowa and there was virtually no TV time available for him to purchase, to advertise, before the New Hampshire primary. I don't think if we do not manage to put limits on corporate spending and the super PACs and what's going on here, I don't think it's very long before they will figure out a way to buy up almost all of the TV time leading up to an election and then allocate that among themselves, sell it to, to you know, furniture stores and car, car, car companies, but they will have bought it in order to control it. So if we don't figure out a way to say, we cannot allow that to happen, that it probably will, we don't get in front of this. But I still think that in terms of free speech, if somebody has the money and they want to rent out a stadium and hold a big rally, okay, that's not a limited commodity in the sense of who's going to go and what's available. They want to hold a parade every day. It's the things that take up 
that, that take away the opportunity for somebody else to use that medium as well. That's the place that I think we need to have the, these regulations for. And whether it's um, publicly financed or not, I think that it's just getting those resources allocated in a way that anybody who's a legitimate person running has the right to access those resources. That was really my point on this. And it's, it's not just about public financing, that it's good, bad, right, and wrong. It's, I think that people should have the right to do whatever they can, if they have the resources for it, as long as it doesn't deprive other people access to those resources. Thank you. Can I speak to that? Of course. Sure. Okay. Um, so I disagree with that in that um, television is irrelevant and it's increasingly irrelevant. The medium, the right. medium You're now right. is the internet. Right. So, <laughs> for for older people and for certain populations, television is still highly relevant. I mean, I'm an advocate for people to use public airwaves um, because of the fact that it is relevant for certain populations. But really, we're looking at the internet, and the resources on the internet are seemingly infinite. Good point. I'm, I'm here. I'm older. I'm learning. So thank you. A lot, maybe. Uh, internet uh, capabilities, maybe the rest of you do too, but is, is it unlimited for, say you have five candidates and they'd all like to have 24-hour presentations for the last two weeks of the campaign, could that happen technologically without them paying anything, without having to have any money? Um, I would say most likely. I mean, if you're talking about broadcast television and cable TV, most likely not. No, I, well, I mean, I don't. I don't know that much about the back end of the industry, but I would say that's that's pay programming. Yeah, they would have to pay for that. I would assume. Well, like the uh, the digital cameras can have audio, can't they? And, and you can plug them into a computer and play them. So, except for buying a camera, uh, could you do that with no expense? As much as you wanted to, any he's, talking, he's talking about on the internet right now. Right, right now, maybe yeah. that's what could be live streaming yeah, right now. In theory, it's 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 fairly free of expenses. I mean, especially as public resources go, um, a, a big resource that we use with Occupy Boston TV is public access. So so far as a working group, we've paid almost nothing for uh, five shows of programming. So we've had two and a half hours of programming that have gone on. Uh, three different stations in the Boston area reaching a potential audience of 60,000 plus we've had them on the web with around 100 hits each. So it's cost us almost nothing but our time. So this is enlightening to me. Yeah. It's a clarification to you. Yes. And we've just got to get Santora to get some good technologically savvy aides to have <laughs> substituted the internet somehow for those television ads. Well, I mean, we're... Iowa. Occupy Boston TV is still getting significantly less hits than you know what we would want, and certainly what you would need to run a decent campaign. You know, so this is you know still have to pay for um, pay for advertising on main websites. So if you're using there's there's ways to use the internet. You know, the using the internet is unlimited in the sense if you want to you know put a blog post or post your video or whatever. But if you want to put your stuff in places where it's going to be seen by a lot of people, it's still going to cost you a lot of money. Um, and so maybe it's not as limited. I don't know how much, you know, if one was to equate an ad on Google to a certain amount of airtime on, you know, a popular TV station, I don't know how that would work out in terms of the resources of the internet versus uh, television airtime, but I still assume it would be a, a limited resource by your definition. I just, I'll just offer the... Um, I, I grant, I'm, I'm older and I am not yet familiar. Uh, yes, of course, I use the internet and I'm well aware, but I think that the threshold is in, your, is in the late 20s. I don't think it's even in the 30s where, I mean, yes, and your age bubble will go through time and, and become more and more predominant. But I think that for anybody basically in the early 30s and over, they're, they're, they're much more TV-oriented, getting information there, than they are Internet-oriented. So um, that bubble has to age through it. So yes, you'll, you'll, you'll take over. <laughs> let, me, let me ask a question on uh, perhaps the middle-aged uh, uh, focus of television um, or stadiums. Is it different than if the um, high school football team 
of one high school has a coach, and he's very rich. Yeah. And so he hires or persuades by money the best player in the whole state to transfer to his high school. Yep. And then all the other teams that have to come up against it don't have the money. Uh, should that be free speech and permitted, or is that unfair because it's not money here it's, and politics isn't a game, but isn't it closer to a game in that we say a level playing field that our democracy, our founding fathers, wanted us not to say the person should be in the Senate who can buy his way in, but the person should be in the Senate whom the voters elect. Now, founding fathers, of course, excluded women, and uh, they weren't perfect, but um, it isn't it a different category. Well, what you're, the example you're giving is uh, there's nothing there's nothing there to, to legislate. There's nothing there to mandate. That is free expression. That's free choice. Someone can go to a different high school if they can qualify to transfer, whether or not there's an economic inducement to do so. So, but that's nothing that that's nothing that's nothing like an election or a public office or anything like that. That's there's a difference between what an individual can do, freedom of choice, freedom of movement, freedom of expression, and in, in, the, in the, ra the realm of, of an election. Well, on, on the college level of sports, I think if a good player transfers to another college, he can't play for a year. Okay, so I'm going to ask if they're recruiting you know, about away. five minutes, you guys wrap And there are some roles we'll like that in sports, and it is then the association of, that, of football of that state that's making the law, it's not public, but we accept that. Um, and I mean, some players don't want to lose a year, so they won't go. Others say, okay, I'll go a total of five years, and I'll have a good last four. Uh, free choice there. But it seems to me that the uh, marketplace analogy to rent a stadium, to show all your new computers, and to have banners, that's all to sell things to people. And as the rhetoricians would say, public office is not for sale. It shouldn't be for sale. Um, but they're selling themselves. I mean, that's what a campaign is. You're selling yourself and your ideas. I mean, it, it is literally the marketplace of ideas at best, and it's the marketplace of campaigns at worst. But having a lot of money, having a lot of money, or however you get it, should not be what determines how much. If the idea is heard, or yeah. if it's a good or bad idea, right, or right. How much influence you can have. I'm not sure just what the answer is. What if part of the sorry? One one thing that you know, part of it might be, and I think it needs to be limited how much people can expect. I would I'm having problems with that, but I would even limit. I would wish there was a way we could limit how much even of their own money they can spend. That gives a real advantage to somebody who has a lot of money or a lot of friends that have a lot of money. Um, it, I think that I think free TV time is important. I think the internet, the problem with the internet, and somewhat also problem with, with community access TV, is that I think you reach the people who already agree with you. You reach your supporters, but you reach the rest. So how to do that? I don't know. On, on the TV question. Uh, Again, the middle-aged of us will remember probably Walter Cronkite's name. He was the icon of uh, um, news, uh, television news anchors. And he proposed, and he thought he was right to his dying day, that the best way to prevent money from influencing the outcome of elections, let alone what the politician does once elected, was to make free television time yeah, available to all of them yep. so many weeks before the election and not allow them to buy any other um, time on television. Now we probably have to relate to the internet, maybe impossible. And he felt that, and he, and he would say in explaining it, that the public owns 
the airways, I think our FCC, Federal Communications Commission, I can, that, can regulate. I just today or yesterday on something on public radio. Yeah, maybe, maybe less than which, which channels would he mandate that free TV to be on? Oh, uh, on his day, there were yeah. only three major yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All three of those. <laughs> So the broadcast. Well, yeah. there had to be the broadcast channels. I think that everything else is no rules. Because <laughs> the FCC is not involved in those. So it would have to be the broadcast channels. But you could, there also could be one basic website that they could use. So that would be the one everybody would go to. Um, and each could yeah. get equal time on it, regardless right. of how much money they want to uh, right. spend. Or, Okay. Um, hi everyone. So I want to um, can I get a mic check, please? Mic check. All right. Thanks, everyone. So I think we're going to end the breakout sessions now, and we have a skit up front. And so I'd like to ask everyone from in the back to move on up to the front to make sure that they can see everything. So everyone, please.